Everybody, good evening. My name is Jim Morris. I'm a deputy city manager here at the city of Daytona Beach. And uh, what we're having this evening is a listening session in relation to the means of accommodating creation of affordable housing. You all may have seen the news or you may otherwise know the city commission met last night in a workshop as a goals and objectives session for the commission. And the commission selected as their number one goal the provision of affordable housing. So there's no question from the commission's perspective or from the staff's perspective as to whether or not affordable housing is needed. The commission acknowledges that. And so in terms of comments tonight, our intention is to listen to you after Mr. Gray makes a brief presentation about means that you think are appropriate to accomplish the provision of affordable housing. The commission understands and wants to have a toolbox, if you will, of how to accomplish its goals of providing additional affordable housing. Daytona Beach has an extensive supply of affordable housing already provided through the Housing Authority, rent supplement programs, and so on. But the Commission also has concluded that additional housing is needed, and that is a part of what we'll be pursuing tonight, not the amount that's needed, but rather how to supply the housing and whatever methodologies there may be. Uh, so from the perspective of that need, the, the session is being recorded. Uh, the Commission will have a link tomorrow where they can come and listen to the entire thing. So the intent here is the staff doesn't have, uh, does not intend to answer questions, but rather just to listen to you, make note of your comments and so on, and try to set the table so the commission can consider things the community thinks is appropriate as a means of providing affordable housing. Affordable housing is a benefit to the community, but it's also a burden from the standpoint of how it's provided. Wherever benefits are created, there's also burdens that are borne by others to pay that expense to accomplish it. From a commission perspective, what I would expect, and I'm not a commission member, I'd simply work with them, but what I would expect is an object on their part to balance goals and objectives of providing it but finding a means to do it in such a way that's fair and equitable. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Robert Gray. He's conducted the study for the city, which is referred to as a nexus study. And effectively, nexus is the point where two things meet, and there's an issue of how you resolve the, meet, the meeting of those two things one being need, the other being the ability to pay for it. The need part, as I said, is acknowledged. So we're here tonight for you to convey your ideas to the Commission as to how to accomplish those things if you have particular ideas as how to do that. Without saying anything further, I'll say that we will have a session of three minutes per comment, and we'd love for you to keep on the topic of how can we meet the need, by what means do we meet that need, if you have ideas on that. As I said, we acknowledge the need is there. So trying to persuade us or the Commission about the need is unnecessary. It's already an acknowledged point. So, Mr. Gray, if you would, and come on up and introduce yourself, and you have a brief presentation, so I just understand it. I appreciate it. I'm Bob Gray. Don't go by Robert. Uh, and I'm Chairman and President of Strategic Planning Group, uh, Inc., and uh, one of our unique specialties in the state of Florida is working with communities uh, and counties on developing tools, if you will, for uh, providing affordable housing and the like. So as I had a lot longer presentation, but having heard that the city approved last night the goal, I just want to say is that, yes, there is a need, without a doubt, uh, in, into the process uh, for affordable housing. I wanted to take one second because of those of you who are following what's going on in my presentation almost a year ago, I made a point that if you have to pick out one factor that's going to have the biggest impact, that in factor is inflation. Inflation as it relates back to interest payments. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you there. Again, at 100 percent median, and this median is using Daytona Beach's numbers, not HUD numbers. You have 44, 491. You can afford roughly a $200,000 home based on assumptions at 4.25% interest. This was all done a year ago. If it went up to 6.2, which has now gone beyond that, that same mid-range is down to 160. So basically every point that changes on the interest rate really impacts about 10% of the housing value. Okay. So if prices went down, needless to say, and the interest goes up, interest far exceeds the price. 
And that is what the, one of the, the problems we're going to have, at least in the short term, as we move forward. Again, uh, as you were saying, we looked at, in terms of the study, both residential units, do they cause uh, a need? Because they do, again, bring construction workers in, uh, people that do reside in, the new coming on in, they need services uh, and the like for affordable. Same thing with non-residential. Again, this was a year ago. How many actually looked at the study? I hope it helped you sleep. <laughs> a lot of numbers in there. But anyway, the bottom line is that 4.5%, you see the gap. If you go to 6.5, and again, I'm stressing right now, it's going to go higher than, than that right now. It's a huge impact in terms of the gap between what people can afford and what their payments are going to be. And I might add that Florida, unlike a lot of other areas, really housing is not going down in price. Okay, And the reason is quite simple. If you have a 3% interest rate, you're not going to sell your house because to move into something at 7%, you can't afford it. Okay, even though it may be significantly less price. So again, you're not seeing a lot of movement at all in terms of the overall housing. Unlike the West Coast, the West Coast is in fact losing. East Coast is not. Okay, I'm not going to go through this because what the linkage fee connection is, but basically what we did in that study looked at how you would price if you were going to use a linkage fee tying construction and costs back to need for affordable housing. And in that thing, we basically on, on the residential look at two things because not all housing is going to be new. Some people are going to buy existing homes that's going to turn. So we looked at actually both new construction, existing construction, basically mathematically averaged it out as a suggestion of fee. Now, I think there was some confusion last though, and I just want to hit in case it comes up again. That's what we say is legally defensible. Nobody in Florida or pretty much south of Maryland uh, ever is, uses the, the max. The, usually the commissioners come in and say, well, like Eatonville uh, over toward Orlando, they said, okay, we understand you can do that. We, we put it at a dollar. Uh, St. Petersburg at one point was looking at maybe three dollars, even though it would be a lot higher. So that's the highest. The political decision is how you weigh things to get to a, 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 an actual number. Non-residential, again, we did new construction combined and the like, and we looked at various types, industrial, commercial, hotel, et cetera, and seeing what that maximum could be. And then we basically came out what that would be. Now, a year ago, the big issue was Housing Bill 7103. And what that did said that if, in fact, you do any of these, the developer needs to be made whole. So if you're getting exactions from him, X, X amount per unit, then we have to figure out ways, permitting, expedited permitting, parking reductions, et cetera. How do we make that whole in terms of a, of a numeric number in the process? So that was the major thing. It also hit, and I want to go back to this in one second, it did allow for inclusionary zoning. And that's a mandatory and residential, if it passes it, that says, okay, if you're doing X units, 100 units, you know, 20% or 10% need to be affordable housing. So that's built into the ability to, to, to permit and to build, exclusionary zoning. Now, I don't have a slide on this one, but as of yesterday, uh, the governor did sign in the Live Local Act, and that is a new set of legislation that's really doing several little quick things. One, it bans rent control, and I think that was the major intent of the legislation. Several communities, Orlando and some others, uh, or Orange County, came up and said, hey, no, we're going to have rent control. That's amazing. The state legislature said, no, you're not. But in the place of it, they've said, okay, under certain conditions, a developer 
can get for the first time uh, ad valorem property tax rebates for affordable housing, and he sets the criteria, you know, for that. So that's another of a of a toolkit, uh, if you will. Plus, they've added more dollars. Now, be aware of one thing: the dollars that are being added are going back to the housing finance authority or corporation, uh, it, which would be administering that. And traditionally, they are doing multifamily. And if you look at the legislation, it really addresses multifamily uh, processes, mixed use, and the like, assuming mixed use has a residential component. The big thing is, and a lot of you who are in the business, it does it by right. If you are owning land that's industrial or commercial, subject to having at least 70 units that are affordable, you have a right to build. It does not go to the city commission, does not have to be rezoned or anything. It is by right. So that's a very potentially a very powerful tool into the process right now. And again, it's industrial and commercial. Then the legislation, which if anybody wants to read it, it's 95 pages uh, of boring reading. It throws out parking as an example of things that you can trade of uh, and the like, and we, we addressed that in our study a year ago. It also says that, you, that once you've by right done something, this local community cannot argue density and it can't argue within certain parameters height restrictions. Okay, so if you're in, let's say, a downtown that has seven, eight stories, yet that building can be eight stories. If it's in a more rural area and the like, it has, it has to be at least three stories. So it's not one and two, it's the minimum is three stories on up. So there's some very strong language uh, that has been taken away from the local governments, given to the state to do affordable housing. And again, what are they? Again, you can do flexible zoning, you can do variances for middle, and that would be for, for residential, because again, the commercial and industrial sort of is taking care of itself from a multifamily component. Reduced parking, accelerated approvals, reduced impact fees, tax incentives, and that's now really been expanded because it's now at Valorum, uh, and growth assistance programs that may, might be done, again, as kickbacks in, into the process. But again, uh, I want to stress that those all are things, and when I was busy in talking with developers, the one that surprised me the biggest has the biggest income back to them on a larger pro is the uh, expedited permit that seems to have the, the biggest impact in terms of their pro formas uh, in the like. So you see it down there, but it is a, a major, major effect. Okay, this is the start. This is a year ago, so we're adding some stuff. To it now, but there are a lot of tools that are potentially available. And when we deal with our clients, a lot of times we'll start with that, and that, in this case, it's going to be expanded and go, which are suitable for Daytona Beach? Not everyone is. Okay, when we were dealing with Palm Beach, they did not want to do inclusionary zoning, for example, uh, for obvious reasons. But I won't go into that right now. But anyway, this gives you some idea of, of the toolkit. And I will say that in cases of policy, it's going to always be, there's no singular arrow. It's going to be multiple approaches to get, especially with we still have to make the developer hypothetically whole <coughs> in terms of he's doing it. Now, the bottom line is this. Do you get dollars? Or do you get units? And that ultimately comes down. And the big problem in the state of Florida is we have a lot of legislation that is collecting dollars and stuff, but we're not seeing a significant amount of affordable housing being actually built. Okay? Uh, California, they're, they're actually building some other places. Uh, and a lot of that is because of inclusionary zoning. But again, it's something to think about. And again, the next steps, that's what we talked about. I'll turn it over to you.
I'm going to elaborate a little bit about what Mr. Gray said in terms of making the developer whole. When you're actually causing costs to be paid by a developer to create something, it's seen as a private payment to accomplish a public burden benefit. And so there's a private burden and a public benefit. So from the perspective of the local government, you're supposed to make that developer whole. In other words, restore their money, the money they spent to create something, they're supposed to be repaid because the provision is seen as a public benefit that the public should pay for. And the way that works is essentially the exchange to the local government to compensate with different things that Mr. Gray has already mentioned. And the inclusionary zoning is something that's an optional tool where in a zoning agreement you'd have a certain percentage of units provided that would be affordable as defined by the economics of the thing, not necessarily the way that it's built. In fact, typically they're built as well as anything else, but the economics of it are changed by supplements given to accomplish that. And with that, uh, if there are any speakers that would like to come up and talk about their ideas, we have mics here. We'll deliver the mics to you so you can stand roughly where you are. It would be appreciated if you would stand while you speak and identify yourself and uh, so we'll know how you can be contacted and the commission will know who's speaking to them and as I said it's a three minute time per speaker and first person we've got a mic ready to come to you if anybody has comments to make good evening good evening everybody my name is Kevin Scott and I'm just going to read a little bit of what I have to make yes sweet. Um, give you a little bit of my personal story. I grew up in public housing, and at the age of 25, I was able to move out on my own and attain my first apartment at the villages of Halifax, thanks in part to the Hope Six program at the time. Eventually, I found stability at my job, moved up a couple of positions, got my finances in order. That put me in a position to sign up for the first time home buyers program, which it, which has been a blessing. Um, I've been a homeowner for the last eight years now, and with that being said, I'm very passionate about helping other people achieve that goal. Um, I'm a member of FAITH. I was at the assembly last Monday, and I want to share with you my support for Affordable Housing Trust Fund and encourage you to fund it with linkage fees. I'm a voter, a resident, and I really want to encourage you to act now to support those who need housing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Good evening. I'm John Navarra. Um, I have experienced lately uh, going to uh, restaurants in uh, the land. I've gone there for business and for some meetings. And the restaurants were often closed, the ones I tried to go to, because they couldn't staff the restaurant. The people uh, couldn't live here and work uh, at a restaurant and make an affordable living. Uh, is there some way that the uh, small business owners could be part of the solution for being able to work on getting affordable housing here in uh, Daytona Beach? Because I don't know how the uh, small businesses are doing uh, on a whole uh, in Daytona Beach right now, but I'm starting to see that in other cities where businesses could have plenty of income, but they actually can't stay open because they don't have the employees. The employees will just leave and go to another community where they can afford to live. People coming down can afford to live on uh, on these uh rents, cost of the rents, but the people who have lived here many years just don't have the income to do it. So I think businesses are going to suffer and the uh, small businesses may be able to somehow help, maybe tax incentives of some sort for small businesses if they help in some other way to help supply um, the housing. And I'm a member of FAITH and I do believe in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, I've kind of researched it. And that is a uh, good solution to this. Thank you. And Mr. Navarro, for purposes of this meeting, I'm going to say that that's your request to the commission to consider that as a tool. Is that acceptable to you? Thank you, sir. My name is Joan Campanaro. I live in 721 Pelican Bay Drive, Stacy Cantu's region. Um, <clears throat> I'm grateful to live in a nice home in a, in a gated com community, but sadly, I see many others that are struggling to afford a safe, clean home for themselves and for their families. 
And in order to do it, they're often working two or more jobs, which means working six to 80 hours a week just to keep a roof over their heads. And when doing it, it also means that they're not available to meet the other needs of their families and often results in children being left to fend for themselves for long areas. We've got to do something better to support our brothers and sisters in our community. I believe an affordable housing trust fund is a great tool to start the process of ensuring all have a safe, clean place to sleep. I support an affordable housing trust fund and believe linkage fees would be an excellent tool for funding it. Also, as a board member of First Step Shelter, I'm confident that if we could get 360 new affordable housing units per year, that would significantly help in the transition out of homelessness for our residents and allow us to help more in need of our support at the shelter. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, I'm Terry Tuminello. I live at 249 Columbus Avenue, and that's zone two. So that means Ken Strickland is my city commissioner. I was at that Faith Action Assembly the other night, and I remember hearing a woman talk about the problems that she had with the place she was renting and how her child was actually bitten by a rat. Now, if you didn't go to the action, I hope that at least you were able to read the paper because the News Journal ran a very good story about that with pictures and everything else. So, you know, my mind started, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania originally, came down here in 05. My mind started working and I started thinking, <clears throat> how are these places still able to be rented? Who controls that? And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the ability to help people buy those properties, rehab them, and make them better and safer? Oh, but wait a minute. That's something that can be done with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. It would help people. It's the right thing to do. Ken Strickland says that a lot. Okay, but let's look at it from the business point of view, okay? Suppose you're a company and you want to come into this area and you need employees. The first thing you do is look at the workforce that's going to be available to work at your company. And if people are traveling from Palm Coast to work where you have your plant or whatever facility is in Daytona Beach, how long do you think they're going to do that when the price of gas goes up and down and up? So affordable housing is not a charity. Affordable housing and that affordable housing trust fund is a very good economic development maneuver because it helps create places for people to live that have to do the work. I, too, have gone to restaurants and seen, you know, please come and work for us. We need people to come and work in this restaurant. I see it all the time, and I eat out a lot. So, I mean, it happens not just in restaurants. Um, anyway, I'm for it. I'm a member of Faith for 18 years. And I think that um, it's wonderful that the study got done, and I hope that the city commission does move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I am Father Philly Gito from Our Lady of Lourdes Parish, which is on 201 University Boulevard in Daytona Beach. I'm here on behalf of Faith, fighting against injustice towards harmony. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Mayor Henry for making time on Monday night to be at our assembly. As the only member of the commission who attended in person, he represented our beloved city well and really looked like a hero for the people. I also thank Ken Strickland, who was able to participate through the power of technology and video. There were over a 1,000 people packed into Our Lady of Hope Church. In fact, we had to open the fellowship hall and live stream the action into that facility. There were 29 congregations represented. It is said that over half of Allen Chapel was in attendance, and certainly over half of Our Lady of Lourdes was in attendance. Now, as you have said, we all know we need affordable housing. So on behalf of all those who were gathered together on Monday night, I want to speak in support of an affordable housing trust fund that is funded by a linkage fee. The Nexus study formalized what faith leaders have been saying for years. We need more affordable housing, and our development boom can pay for it. Now is the time to act, and I urge the city staff 
and the Commission to adopt the next steps from the study as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mary Chinati. I do live right here in Daytona Beach. Um, I'm right here on Virginia Avenue. But the comments I'm going to share tonight are based on my experience the last nine years spending them in the affordable housing industry. So I was the one that used to answer the phone calls when people used to call and say, I need your help. My lot fees have gotten so high I can't afford to pay them anymore. My husband and I purchased this home together years ago, and now that he's gone, I have one income and I can't afford them anymore. So I do believe there has to be some type of cost control where lot, lot rents can't go up so high that people can't afford to stay in the homes that they literally purchased on their own years before. Um, there also, uh, I think you mentioned, there was a percentage of affordable needs. Uh, I do believe that that should be increased. Having been in the industry, I know that there was what we called the LURA. When people got in a, um, they get their tax credits in order to build affordable housing. There's section 42 of the IRS code that would allow them to get tax credits, which means they can afford to offer lower rents. So perhaps we need to look at doing something like that, whereas there's a, an accountability on behalf of the developers where they have to meet a criteria. The Land Use Restrictions Act tells them they commit to certain things that they have to offer back to the people that are renting there in order to accomplish getting that particular discount or that, that tax credit. So um, I do believe that there's a lot of already existing legislation that we could probably pull toward this, but the linkage fees going into an affordable housing trust fund is one way to afford, I'm sorry, one way to prepare proactively for the future. I understand that there's money coming in from HUD, but that to me is a temporary solution to help us get over a, a, an immediate crisis. I do believe we need a solution for a long term so that we can be more proactive in the future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm Sue Odina. I live at 716 North Wild Olive, Daytona Beach, also a member of Our Lady of Lords and Faith, and several other uh, volunteer groups in the, in the area. As you know, Jim, we met three years ago trying to uh, work on an affordable housing development in Derbyshire. In that three years, we have not been successful in our quest for tax dollars from the Sadowski Fund or Florida Housing Corporation. In the last 10 years, Volusia County has had very little uh, luck in getting any of that. I have turned in an LOI on a property just this afternoon, hoping for some tax funds to develop affordable housing. If we had a community trust fund that we could count on here in Daytona, it might very well help to produce some houses. If you can only afford $700 a month and the rent that the developer is now going to charge on the property in Holly Hill uh, for $1,400 a month for a, a one-bedroom apartment, it doesn't make sense. So. I do support a trust fund. Thank you. And Sue, if you'll permit me the courtesy for the audience, Sue and her group have applied along with some other folks for Florida state dollars to support projects that they've proposed. The city has worked with those groups to support them, but the application is effectively a, a raffle, I guess, or a lottery. And the applicants from Daytona Beach, while supported by the city, have not been successful in the lottery. Thank you. Ann Ruby, 137 Park Avenue. I'd like to see the commission do a few things. Um, I'd like to see them make it easier to build something less than 900 square feet on less than 5,000 square feet of land. Because if you're going to do infill housing, sometimes that's what you need. I'd like to see them be able to build, make it easier to build two and three families and single family zoned areas. I'd like to see the city donate their lots and then um, do some creative housing on it. Container homes, clusters of container homes. 
um, tiny houses, prefab homes, modular homes. Do things that you can get the buildings up with less money, not stick built, off the ground so they don't flood. But the city owns a lot of property in the infill areas, and those could be developed into housing. They don't all have to be single family. I'd like to see us um, bring back single room only rentals. Because there is a need for that. Not everyone needs a home, a, a home, but they need a room. They need a place to stay. Um, I think the trust fund is a great idea. As I recall, I've heard two developers commit $75,000 each to that trust fund. I don't know that they've, it's ever been collected, but they did commit it, I believe. Um, when negotiating PVs, Ask for contributions. Each PD, each planned development is supposed to have a benefit to the community. And it can't just be the existence of the, of the development. So I think the commission needs to set clear guidelines for how this is going to happen. So that when staff is negotiating with developers, they know what to ask for and developers know what to expect. So that's, I think that might be all I have on my list. Thank you, Ann. Um, I think that's it. Sandy might get first. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Sandy Murphy. Um, I agree with what Ann was saying. I think that one thing that we have lost is mobile home communities that one of the other presenters talked about. And I think we need to find ways to allow those to happen. Again, not everybody needs the same space. And we have to start recognizing that. Not every project needs the same tools. A land trust is a great idea, but it's not the only way to go about it. And I think the most important thing that we have to focus on is partnerships. We need to use the expertise that's already in the community, groups like the Housing Authority, groups like Mid Florida, who are already doing that, and give them the mechanisms, give them the means, give them the support and also make it easier to do a wide variety of projects. But not, let's not just focus on that one methodology. Let's look at all the resources, and one spot where I think we've come up short all the time is we have done very poorly in terms of bringing philanthropic money into our affordable housing. And I think that's something that the city itself can go after more uh, more strongly and that the nonprofits in the city should also be going after to expand our, our funding availability. Other speakers? Back here in the back. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Lee Morrissey. I live in Daytona Beach, 333 Pelican Avenue, which is Zone 2. I have a number of hats that I wear, including a planning consulting and also growth management action chair for the League of Women Voters. Um, I think the city of Daytona Beach has been very aggressive in pursuing a number of different avenues for affordable housing, and I applaud the commission for doing so. I can tell you that my next door neighbor is already implementing the ADU ordinance. Um, so, uh, so yay for that, and it's a single-family neighborhood. Uh, some questions that, um, for your consideration, particularly uh, with the linkage fee, which um, would be wonderful, it is wonderful, Daytona setting an example for the rest of this county on using innovative tools uh, to pursue more aggressively the provision of affordable housing. Uh, question, will the, fee, the, the revenues be expended solely on capital expenditures, as in the actual provision of affordable housing as opposed to staffing and administration? Will there be a citizen oversight committee established for reporting and transparency purposes for the use of funds and the establishment of land trusts. The linkage fee in particular um, is the fee, it, it's a little unclear, um, and I suspect this is policy direction. Um, the Nexus study indicates you can apply the fee to residential and non-residential. Um, certainly, I think um, 
We need to look at the non-residential uh, in terms of those low-wage jobs um, that unfortunately we have quite a few of in our community and I think it is very reasonable for it to be considered there. I would question uh, applying the linkage fee on new affordable housing. And um, then uh, certainly your, uh, your implementation program, I would hope, considers a diversity of housing types, single family, multifamily, ownership, rental, as well as uh, diversity in location. Let's not put all the affordable housing in one area. Uh, we, I think, who live here pride ourselves that we reside in a diverse community and affordable housing can continue to make us strong if we don't isolate it in certain areas. Thank you, Shirley. The gentleman, Back here. Well, there's a gentleman over here as well. Okay. So. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, sir. My name is Charles Woodyard. I am the CEO of the Daytona Beach Housing Authority. Uh, I'm fairly new to this area, but I want to talk about three things, and if they've been brought up before and shot down, uh, please excuse me for and that. Mr. Woodyard, before you go further, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for having this. Uh, the first thing, uh, tax increment financing. I believe the state of Florida voted TIF financing into law several years ago. Usually in a community, if they want to consider tax increment financing, they may have to designate certain areas as TIF areas. There's a lot of bureaucracy associated with that. But there are some ways around TIF financing, formal TIF financing. You can do an informal TIF financing or what some people call a synthetic TIF financing. So what does that mean? So instead of just going through the formal TIF process, you just work with the developer and understand there's going to be an incremental increase in ad valorem taxes over a number of years. You can kind of uh, capitalize that and then say, as a city, I will dedicate some funds, let's say for infrastructure, that go into financing an affordable housing project. So that's number one. Number two, uh, I support uh, an affordable housing trust fund, absolutely. I like to think that there are different ways to finance that trust fund, uh, along with linkage fees. I, I agree with that. Now, so what I want to suggest to you, though, is that you look at some general obligation bonds. Now, this may have a bad history in Daytona Beach. I don't know. Uh, but you don't have to start off with three or four or five million dollars. You can start off with 500,000 to a million dollars or something like that. And then over the years, it may gradually increase. This requires persuasion and marketing in your, uh, in your uh, campaign when it goes to the voters. But it is a different way to capitalize a housing trust fund. And the third thing is we have a very good relationship, we being the housing authority, uh, we have a very good relationship with the city of Daytona Beach and their staff. I think it's time to take that relationship to a new level, and I think it's getting there. I think it needs to be more formalized. Uh, I think if the city's uh, staff and commission can work with the housing authority staff and commission, we can find ways for, let's call it uh, conventional financing and maybe avoid the trap of the, uh, what, what do you want to call it, tax uh, credits here. It's kind of uh, a lottery system. Yes, sir. And I'm not from this state, so I've never seen this before. It should be more of a meritocracy, but it is not. And so we need to work if, you know, the Housing Authority has roughly a $15 million budget and has capacity to go beyond that uh, if we can work together and build some more units. I'm suggesting that we really form a partnership, a formalized partnership between the Housing Authority and the City of Daytona Beach and work on ways to avoid <laughs> As you sit down, let me say I think the commission will welcome your comments, your later comments in regard to a partnership. And, and as it relates to the tax increment, we didn't do precisely that, but we actually have gotten about 
425 units at the Cape Atlantic development through tax return in exchange. And so we're working with that. But thank you for your comments. I'm sure the Commission will be interested to hear them. Next speaker, please. Over on the far side. Jessica, raise your hand a little more. Thank you. Hello, Jessica Gow. Um, I would say with Cobb Cole Law Firm, but I'm here just as a resident today. Um, like Sarah Lee, I like to wear many hats, um, including working with the county on their affordable housing master plan, closely tracking this linkage fee discussion we've had, and being someone who grew up in affordable housing. Um, so it's a passion project, um, and as a local land use attorney, I represent um, a wide spectrum of affordable housing developers, from single family, high density, multifamily, even tiny homes now. I can check that off. We're working on a project. <laughs> um, so I think that an affordable housing Housing Trust Fund is a great mechanism. I don't know that linkage fees are the best financing structure for it. Um, I think there's other funding available. I came this morning from Tallahassee with your local chamber delegation um, talking to our representatives about the Live Local Act that just got signed into law. That's $700 million that will be targeted for affordable housing above and beyond what we typically see. Um, I think that Daytona has been kind of a catalyst for the discussion here in the county. and. You guys have been on the leading edge. So when we talk about synthetic TIF, when we talk about ADUs and things like that, we've made great strides. Um, I'd like to see us continue to be on that leading edge, and I think there are things we can do. Um, some of them, and I'll talk quickly, like Anne, um, allowing administrative adjustments to lot development criteria for affordable housing projects so you don't have to go through a variance or a rezoning process. Allowing the development of affordable housing or ADUs on non-conforming lots, so lots that are a little smaller than what they're supposed to be. And we have a lot of those in our Midtown area that I think would be really helpful. Um, administrative variances for individual parcels um, for non-conforming lots would be fantastic. Let's see what else we have here. Impact fee waivers for ADUs that are restricted for income would be great. Um, and when you lo look at state law, um, when I say Daytona has been on the leading edge, the Live Local bill allows for tax abatements for affordable housing. We've done that for years. Uh, so one of the questions that comes up is when the state says you can do affordable housing in any zoning district, the question is what rules apply? So I would love to see the city um, get ahead of that and say for affordable housing within any district or any land use here, the you know setbacks and density requirements, looking at lot sizes and unit sizes, looking at parking requirements, all of those are things that we can do today to ensure that we continue to have the partnerships and collaboration that we've seen. So. Thank you, Jessica. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Trular. I actually live in Port Orange, but I own two properties in Daytona that I've recently put on the market due to, uh, with no mortgages, uh, the association dues, special assessments. The taxes um, are really just more than I can get uh, for rent. So that's sad to me. Uh, I definitely support the linkage fees, especially on all fronts, but especially on the, the commercial uh, front. I, I believe that uh, in addition to the affordable housing issue, we have an issue where employers are not paying a living wage. And if we're not paying a living wage, then linkage fees um, will need to make up that difference, in my opinion. I am a business owner for 25 years here locally. And um, I just really support this. I hope that, you know, we, I actually, however long ago, before the housing bust, I was actually part of an affordable housing committee with Faith, and we tried to get an affordable housing ordinance to um, incorporate affordable housing into all developments. That, I think, would be the optimum because you could really do a lot societally um, and culturally with that that would go far beyond just the affordable housing, but um, we looked at trust funds and we looked at linkage fees and, um, and TIFs, and uh, so I just, you know, that's probably 15 years ago, so I, I, this, this whole area, this whole community means the world to me. Um, I, I just hope that we have the political will to do this, but I really, I really just support these, and I'm, I'm so sad that, that my properties that I'm selling because no one can afford just to cover the bare um, expenses, so thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Speakers, please. John Nicholson, Daytona Beach. Um, yes, I support the trust fund. I was on the committee for that. It's a great idea, but it can't be the only idea. It's got to be one of many. Secondly, 
I like the linkage fees. It's a good idea. I absolutely oppose Faith's idea of $10 a square foot. It's way too much. $20,000 added to a house. They're already expensive as it is now. I would rather go, as he said, with $1. At least we get the money. At least it gets passed. And we have the money to build and do what we need to do. Uh, third, if you read the, uh, link, um, the Nexus study, it says the city of Daytona Beach has all of the housing that we need for affordable housing. We send people out to work. So Daytona Beach is in the position where most of our uh, workers leave the city to work. Most, read the linkage study, most of the people from outside come into work. It's exact opposite of what we need. We have the best HUD housing program in the county. We have the largest HUD housing program in the county. We basically have done what we need to do at the bottom end. We're moving up to the middle end for those people who are working and need a place to stay, that are working and need a place to live and own. We can't just always have apartments, although we need to do those first. We need to get all of our workers a place to live and then get them a place to own. Thank you. Thanks, John. Next speaker, please. Other speakers? Yes, ma'am. Over here in the, by the column. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Patty Phelan. I'm a resident of Daytona Beach and a member of FAITH. And I would like to speak in support of an affordable housing trust fund that is funded by a linkage fee. The Nexus study formula, formalized what faith leaders have been saying for years. We need more affordable housing, and our development boom can pay for it. And the Amazon facility would have made 14 million for affordable housing trust fund with $5 per square foot. We really lost that. That was a bad one. Um, now is the time to act. I urge city staff and the commission to adopt the next steps from the study as possible. And all the other great ideas that came up too. Thank you, Jim. Okay. If there's no more takers going once. Oh, and, and you've been on. <laughs> and Ruby again. I think the other thing we need to consider, and it might be uh, in this conversation, is um, uh, transportation. Because right now, for many families, transportation is mu as much a burden as housing. So we need to make sure that our mass transit stays healthy and strong and I can't be left out of this discussion, although I think it has to be part two. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. And these, all this will be conveyed to the commission. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been taking notes on every speaker in terms of your comments and your name, not your address. And we appreciate all of you being here. Mr. Woodger, you particularly, glad to have you here. And glad to have everyone else as well. Thank you again for coming. Mm -hmm.